Okay, so I want to start by the fact that the work that I do um, is actually work that is done in collaboration with my colleague uh, Fatima, who is standing there. And this is a picture of us doing field work uh, last year in Rwanda. Um, in way of background, I would like to uh, put it to you that um, there are essentially two possible views that you can take with respect to the conne connections between syntax and phonology. And I want to be clear from the outset which view I take. Uh, there is the, the, the so-called the standard T model, the Chomsky uh, uh, idea, which is b uh, basically syntactocentric. Okay, so the idea is that everything that happens that matters happens really in the syntax, and the phonological and the, the meaning interfaces read off things from the syntactic computation. Uh, now, one great advantage of this view is that it accounts for uh, what is, by and large, a fact that syntax is more, more or less free of any phonological information. Okay, we don't have syntactic rules that specifically refer to phonological segments, let's say. Uh, and that falls out from this system because phonology only has access to syntax, but not the other way around. Now, uh, to quote Chomsky, he, um, this is not necessarily the whole story because this theory adopts the non-obvious hypothesis that there are no actual interactions between phonology and meaning that would be in the, to the exclusion of syntax, the direct interactions. And I think... Uh, one of those, one, one, of, one of the main candidates for such an interaction is what we call the stress focus correspondence principle, which is the idea that the focus of an utterance, which is a pragmatic or information structural no notion, uh, has a, um, a correspondence to a prosodic notion, prosodic prominence. Let's not go into the phonetic details of what we mean by that at this point. Now, if there is such a correspondence, there, are essentially only, there is essentially only one view you can take in this system, which is to encode some kind of feature in the syntax that will then get sort of trickled down to the LF component and become focus, and trickle down to the PF component and become uh, main prominence. Uh, there are many problems with, uh, with, with this view, which I will not talk about today. Instead, what I will uh, uh, tell you is, is our view, which is... Um, which does assume a direct uh, inter uh, interface, which does assume a communication be potentially between information structure and prosody, but it also, of course, assumes that prosodic structure and syntactic structure have a strict mapping. Okay? Now, th this view, as I said, does not have this problem that it has to encode everything into the syntax uh, 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 regarding PFLF correspondences, but the challenge for this view is that the actual mapping between the, the, between the modules must be specific and deterministic enough for the users of the language of language to be able to uh, actually use it. So it has to be able to be you know you have to be able to parse language and you have to be able to acquire it. Okay, so uh, whatever is sitting there uh, uh, is, is crucial for this system, and the rest of the talk is about what uh, part of that we think looks like. Okay, so. Um, as Aditi already adhered uh, to uh, or, or re referred to, um, there, are, there are certain views uh, about the prosody syntax interface that are uh, quite commonly assumed. Uh, in particular, uh, it is quite commonly assumed that prosodic structure has its own hierarchy made up of a phonological word, a phonological phrase, and an intonational phrase. Now, uh, it is by and large, uh, I think, uncontroversial to assume that there are mappings between these units and syntactic units. Whether those mappings are always, always taking place or whether they are driven, whether there are additional phonological processes, I, I, I don't actually think I disagree that I think there is a lot to be said about what goes on in phonology as, uh, in addition to what, uh, is, uh, what, what the mapping is concerned with. But what I'm concerned with is, is the mapping. And in particular, uh, I'm concerned with, with today about the mapping on the highest level, on the level of the intonational phrase. Okay, so, you know, phonological words correspond to heads or essentially uh, syntactic heads, uh, prosodic phrases to some kind of syntactic phrases. 
Now the question is, what's the syntactic clause? What do, how, do, how do we make sense of the clause for the purposes of the phonological uh, uh, um, syntax mapping? And there are various proposals in the literature, uh, um, largely quite technical and mostly based on generative ideas of how syntax looks like. So, you know, some people propose that it's the uh, info, uh, IP or the TP that corresponds to the clause. Others propose that it's the CP. Yet others uh, say that it actually varies between smaller parts of the clause and larger part of the clause, uh, and so on and so forth. There are many, many pr uh, proposals. Um, what we are going to uh, uh, propose here is uh, that there are essentially two things that really matter, and, and, uh, and I will go through uh, these two things in, uh, uh, before I give you the actual mapping principles that, uh, that we propose. Okay, so um, what has been um, proposed already in the 70s uh, and has been sort of taken on uh, by others uh, since is this idea that phonological boundaries are inserted as leftmost and rightmost constituents of every root node. Okay, so the idea is that you want to uh, be able to see the edges of, of, of sentences, okay, of, 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 uh, of root sentences. Now, uh, Really what helps the listener, okay, when you're trying to parse something, is that if sense units correspond to intonational units, okay? That is the kind of, from a parsing perspective, that's a helpful thing. So basically, the, the, the idea is you should try to avoid prosodic boundaries that break up what are sense units. So here is uh, um, an example of, uh, of how, how, to, how you can think about this. This is from Truckenbrot. I don't want to you know, bore you with the details of the example, but the idea is here that if you have a closal coordination, okay, then the natural way to, to, uh, to, to pronounce it is by two separate intonational phrases, and especially you, you kind of have to do that if you have uh, sentential ad adverbs that, are, that, that separate, okay, which be because those sentential adverbs mark you that those are sense units, sort of speech acts on their own. Okay? But interestingly, um, you can have a very interesting uh, um, thing in German where you uh, have um, a sentential adverb in, in only the first conjunct, okay? And that can sort of take scope over the whole of the conjunct, of the, of the, of the two conjuncts. But in that case, the intonation has to be altered. And in, in particular, what you see from the intonation is that the whole uh, two, con two, two clauses are in one intonational domain. Okay, so basically what you see is a correlation between how many sense units you would like and how many intonational units you get. Okay, this is just by way of introduction of that idea. Okay, so uh, we do think that, th that you do have to mark whatever is like a speech act as, a, as an intonational phrase. But we do, we, we're not going to, uh, we just sort of take that over from the literature. But in addition to that, we have a very specific syntactic proposal. And this is really, it's true, it's a very, very syntactic proposal. Um, and the proposal is, is essentially this. Uh, in the syntactic hierarchy of the, of the tree, the verb, the overt verb, can sit uh, at, at a higher or lower position. And what I be my, my verb or verbal material, essentially you can think of whatever is the finite part of the, of the, of the verbal pr uh, projection line. So, you know, you can think of the notion of extended projections, if, uh, if that means uh, uh, anything to you. And the idea is, whatever the phrase, okay, that is the highest member of the extended projection of the main uh, projection line whose head is overtly filled, where you actually see material there, that's the phrase that you're going to map for your international phrase. That's the proposal. Okay? And uh, I'll, uh, I'll spend a, you know, a, a lot of the, t the time of in this talk to actually defend that position. Okay? Now, so far I've only given you um, a mapping from the syntax to the prosody. Okay? And uh, in in, uh, in agreement with the original proposal by Downing, okay, what we, what we propose is that in terms of syntax prosody mapping, okay, the idea is, you remember, you don't want to break up sense units. The idea is whatever corresponds to the root verb, okay, so the highest projection inside the root clause is what corresponds to, uh, to an intonational phrase. Okay, this is not going to be not going to matter until you actually look at complex clauses. So for all the simplex clauses we look at, it doesn't matter whether this has the root in it or, uh, in the definition or not, but it does. Now, in terms of the the uh, uh, this, um, 
uh, as I said, we also uh, uh, adopt the, the idea that speech acts uh, are also mapped onto uh, um, intonational phrases. Now, when it comes to the prosody to syntax mapping, okay, this is the mapping in the other direction, okay, from prosody to syntax, your motivations are different, okay? Now, why would you want to ma mark your prosodic st structure in your syntax? Okay, why would you want to do that? Well, the motivation, I believe, comes from infant language acquisition. So infants actually have an extremely um, sophisticated ability to hear uh, um, prosodic information and to use it uh, to acquire language. Okay, we know that because we can now do brain imaging on newborns and some people in the womb even, all that sort of thing. So there's a really a growing body of literature that shows to us that, that infants really, really listen to intonation and they use that information to make uh, um, predictions about where the syntactic boundaries lie. Okay? Now, in order for, not to, for us not to confuse an infant learner, okay, it's important that we avoid putting prosodic boundaries that do not match syntactic boundaries. Okay? Remember, in the, in the earlier case, it was the idea that if you have a sense, uh, a sense unit, that has to be wrapped in, in one intonational phrase. This one is actually weaker. It, o only, it only says, well, if you do have a boundary, it better correspond to a syntactic boundary, otherwise it's going to confuse children. Okay? Okay. So for that reason, uh, the, uh, in, in, the, in the back direction, in the phonology to syntax direction, uh, we don't make reference to the root clause, we simply make reference to the position of the verb. Okay, so the idea is align the left edge of an intonational phrase with the left edge of, uh, of a clause, the clause being the highest projection whose head is overtly filled by verbal, verbal material. It will be a lot clearer when I get to the examples, I just wanted you to have, the, have it in front of you, what, what the proposal is. Okay, so I'm going to work with a tree that is really uh, sort of rudimentary and it really, the, the labels totally don't matter because what matters is where the verb actually sits or whatever the finite auxiliary, uh, if there is one, actually sits. So, um, so let me exemplify how this system would work. Well, in a language like Hungarian, okay, uh, where typically there are no auxiliaries, um, the, the ones that are, they're really like verbs and things like that, uh, with very few exceptions. Uh, basically what happens in this language is that the verb stays really low. You know, pick your favorite theory, whether you want to call it PREDP or VP, or, it doesn't matter. The verb stays low, much lower than the, uh, the inflection domain and the CP domain. Now, in this case, what you predict is that the intonational phrase will be actually uh, encompassing the, uh, the, this domain. Uh, because that's where the verb is, okay? Now, take a language like Italian, where you have a, a, the verb moving to, uh, to a higher position, to the inflection node, uh, closer to the, to the, uh, to the subject uh, node. Now, in this case, because the verb is in a higher position, the intonational phrase will be, by our definition, uh, a, a, a bigger junk, okay? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's the idea. Now, in, in both those cases, uh, remember that there is an additional... Uh, intonational phrase boundary assigned by the, uh, by what's a speech act, and the speech act is typically the whole the whole of it. Okay, so what you get is, in actual fact, this will be the innermost segment of the intonational phrase, and there will be an outermost segment that encompasses that always encompasses everything. Okay, so what we uh, what we work with is a theory where intonational phrases can be recursive. Okay, which is uh, it didn't used to be the case, but it's quite it's quite commonly assumed nowadays. Okay, so uh, let's take a language like um, German, which is a V2 language. In this case, the verb sits all the way high up as in C. In this case, of course, the whole CP will be, an inter will be the core intonational phrase, and it will also be, of course, the, 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 the speech act intonational phrase as well. Okay, so what does that buy us? What, what does this theory actually do for us? Okay. Now, uh, one of the first uh, things I would like to tell you about is, uh, is a construction in Hungarian that you may have heard of, uh, which is called the Hungarian left peripheral focus construction. What happens in Hungarian is if you try to focalize a noun phrase, which is indicated here by uh, <coughs> capitals because it, the focal uh, um, word is always carries main accent in Hungarian, is this element will have to occur in a left peripheral position in the clause, okay? And not only that, it actually has the verb 
moving next to it. Okay, so so verb movement to that to the head position uh, accompanies the movement of the focal element to the, to the left periphery in Hungarian, and you can see that because the particle of the verb is left behind, just like you see this in, v, in V2 in German. Okay, now how does that actually uh, uh, work in our system? Well. Remember, I said that in a neutral Hungarian clause, the verb stays quite low. And, and in that case, the intonational phrase is quite small. Now, in this case, because the verb actually moves to a higher position, the, uh, the, uh, the phrase that now counts for the intonational phrase mapping is actually larger. Okay? And very handily, it has a specifier position just at the left edge of that phrase, okay? which will, once you map this onto an intonational phrase, will be the left edge of the intonational phrase, okay? which happens to be in Hungarian, the head of the intonational phrase, because Hungarian has leftward oriented stress. Okay? So what you end up with is really uh, that the, all these things conspire to give you a perfect focus position. Okay? The verb moves, thereby enlarges the, in the intonational phrase. That gives you a slot where you can move your focal element, and that slot will actually be the slot where the main, uh, main accent falls once you do your prosodic mapping. Okay, so th this is where you see that this is the intonational phrase and this is the leftmost phonological phrase within that intonational phrase. Okay, now what happens to topics in Hungarian? Well, topics uh, basically adjoin to, fo fo to, the, to, the con to the XP that contains the focus. Okay, so topics are external to the focus always. Okay, so Peter here is the topic. And given the mapping that we assume, okay, they will be there, thus external to this core intonational phrase. Because the core intonational phrase, remember, is determined by the position of the verb, which is underlined for you here. And the, uh, the orange uh, phrase, whatever you want to call it, you can call it FOCP, but you really don't have to, which is a nice thing about this. That corresponds, that phrase will correspond to the intonational phrase, so the topic will fall outside of that. Um, as you can see here. Now, if there were verb movement to the higher topic position, then of course the intonational phrase would be enlarged, okay? And then it would be all of a sudden the topic that would be sitting at the left edge of the phrase. But crucially, there is no verb movement. Um, and in fact, actually, I don't really know any language that uh, sort of has a topic construction that involves verb movement. And our, our theory sort of is quite, uh, sort of predicts that that wouldn't be the case. Now, what, you, what happens is then that, that, that here the topic sits in a position sandwiched between the sort of outside the core intonational phrase, but inside the bigger intonational phrase. Now, I'm going to um, give you some, f some, some actual sort of phonetic, uh, sort of, tr sort of, you know, visualized tracks that, that actually su suggest that that is the right prosodic analysis. Uh, but before I do that, I also have to, t uh, to tell you uh, a little bit more about what, what I mean by leftward, left, uh, leftward oriented stress in Hungarian. So uh, the, the, uh, the Hungarian stress rule uh, has, this, uh, has this system where, this is our proposal about, uh, about it, where the main stress sits on the leftmost phonological phrase within the I, that's Andrew L, is very highly ranked. Uh, um, so that, that, that will be observed uh, every time it can be observed. Um, but uh, it's st uh, but there's, there's a constraint that's hi ranked th higher still, which is that a every intonational phrase has to have a head. Okay, there has to be a stressed phonological phrase inside every intonational phrase. And in fact, it's a combination of these two that gives you exactly the desired uh, mapping. Maybe I can just uh, draw this very quickly here. So if you have um, a recursive structure, okay, and if you had Andrew L being the highest ranked, then actually your main stress would fall on this phonological uh, phrase here, because that's leftmost within this phonological phrase, uh, in this intonational phrase. Or at least that would be one of the options. But what really happens is this, okay? It's, it's going to be leftmost within the innermost intonational phrase. And that, uh, that is actually because this way, both intonational phrases ha have a head. Okay, so sort of it's, uh, it's just a technical solution to, uh, to how we get the right stress pattern. Okay, but how does it actually look like? Oh, it looks really ugly, but uh, I don't know why. Anyway, it's sort of good enough. Okay, so this is a, 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 a speech track of a sentence. Uh, the Malai girl uh, to Eleonora escaped 
from Emilia or something like that. You get all the sonorants so that you get a nice track. So uh, here what you can see is that uh, the topic, the Malai girl, okay, is followed by an international uh, b uh, b boundary. And then uh, the, um, there is a fall um, starting on the focal element. Uh, and, um, and then the verb and everything else is actually pretty much de-stressed. Um, which is what uh, the phrasing that we predict. Now, uh, here is a really nice uh, thing about Hungarian, which was actually discovered by Bob Ladd in the, uh, uh, in the 80s, or, or even earlier, I think, uh, that there is a really, really nice tune, okay, that helps you identify both left and right edges of international phrases, and that's the Eastern European question tune. And Hungarian has the Eastern European question tune. Now, what happens in that case is that um, there is, it starts, the Eastern European question tune starts with a low, uh, that, that you anchor that on the, stre on, the on the syllable that has a main stress. And then there is a sort of uh, rise at the very end, like a, uh, um, on the penultimate syllable you get a high tone and then in the final syllable you get a low tone. So I can, I can pronounce this for you, or whichever I can pronounce for you. Um, um, there's this thing at the end, that's the Eastern European question tune. And it's anchored on the, on the, on the verb, okay, in a, in a neutral sentence. So you can see that uh, here, uh, following the, uh, the topic, you get the start of the tune. And if there is a focal element, then it is anchored on the focus. And this is something that Lad himself uh, noted. So, you know, if you don't trust my phonetics, you can, I'm sure you trust his. So uh, this is, would be... Uh, um, a case where, with a focus, and this would be just a neutral sentence. And again, that corresponds to exactly the international phrasing that we propose, right? So in the, I, if the topic precedes just a normal VP, then the verb, which happens to be the leftmost within that international phrase, will be the anchor for this tune. And if there is a focal element, then the topic will precede this, and then it will fall on the focus. So just, just as we predicted. Okay, so uh, so what what this tells what this gives you is uh, a way to account for the idea that uh, where am I? Yeah, uh, you know why in Hungarian uh, this focus uh, stress correspondence principle is satisfied. It's satisfied in a really interesting way. It's satisfied by creating the uh, the appropriate syntactic configuration that once you map onto prosody in the absolutely neutral way, there are no extras in the mapping, okay, then it gives you the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the, um, the fact, which is what you want, that the focal element sits at the left edge of the core international phrase. Okay. This is the same with the declarative. It doesn't matter. I think it's enough to have a question. Okay, so to summarize, as I said, Hungarian left peripheral focus is actually analyzed then as a syntactic operation that is stress-driven or driven by the, by the need for the focal element to pick up the main, uh, main, uh, main stress. And it has an unmarked syntax prosody mapping and a an totally unmarked prosody because the Hungarian prosody is, is left-headed. What is marked in Hungarian is the syntax, okay? It moves to that position where the focal, focal uh, stress will be assigned. Now, just to sort of compare that, you get an entirely different story in a language like English, where you typically alter the prosody and leave the syntax intact. Okay, so it's a sort of question of which module uh, gives way and which one is more rigid in order for you to be able to put your main stress on the focus. Okay. Now, uh, as, as it, when it comes to topics, uh, what we, what we uh, predict is that these left peripheral topics sit outside the innermost international phrase, and therefore, th uh, because they are not accompanied by verb movement, okay, so this is not an accident, it actually falls out of the system that they will do, uh, and by assumption, it's the innermost in, uh, I that's always, the t uh, always uh, because uh, by assumption, it's the verb that tells you where that boundary is, okay? So that assumption actually gives you the fact that because the topic is not accompanied by verb movement, it will fall outside. And that's the right result, right? So topics never get main accent. They can have uh, uh, phrasal accents, but they never get the, the main accent. Okay. Now, uh, there are some implications uh, which I want to uh, go into a little bit. Uh, let's see how long I want to go into. Okay. Uh, so left peripheral focus movement, if it's stress driven like in, it is in Hungarian, should always be accompanied by verb movement. Okay, that's a prediction that this theory 
makes. Okay, so because if there's no verb movement, there's no enlargement of the intonational phrase, and then you're not really providing a slot for the focal element. The converse is not true, so sometimes you get verb movement even though the position that gets created is not necessarily a, a focus position, it maybe it's just an optional focus position. A good example of that would be V2 in German. Okay? So V2 just happens because German syntax tells you V2 happens, and then it does provide a slot at the left edge of the, uh, of the, of the CP, which is, as we know, sometimes exploited by you know, uh, OVS structures for focal, focal purposes, but it is not per se a focus construction. Okay, and that's because actually German does not have left peripheral stress. It, left peripheral stress is quite marked in German. It normally has rightward oriented stress. But as I said, sometimes the syntax provides you with the verb movement and then there is the option of using that position for focus. But in Hungarian, really, the, pr the, the position gets created for focus. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what happens. Now, the other prediction that comes from that is that you will not expect focal, uh, like this kind of focus construction to happen without verb movement, okay? Now, that means that we have to completely reanalyze the, so the sort of classic Italian left peripheral focus uh, as something that's not actually uh, prosodically driven, because in Italian you don't have verb movement accompanying the focus. Now, um, how do we deal with that? Well. Um, I'll t tell you a bit more about that in a, in a second. Uh, the other prediction that, we, that this theory makes is that topic constructions, constructions that are specific for topics, okay, should not typically accompany, uh, sh should not be typically accompanied by verb movement because that would have the undesired effect of enlarging the verb, uh, the, the intonational phrase. Okay, uh, so. Um, there are, you know, in, in, our, in our papers with Fatima, we, we provide a, quite a detailed account of uh, different constructions in Hungarian, these are the ones that I've already told you. Now, basa is a tone language that we, uh, that we deal with just to, 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 to show you that actually it's not stress per se that, uh, that, that makes this whole thing work. Um, and, uh, and you can have tonal processes telling you where the boundaries are, and those boundaries still correspond to the syntactic uh, conf configurations that we predict. Um, now, what about Italian? Well, there is a debate in Italian, and uh, um, we are in this sort of convenient position that we can just let them sort out that debate until we can finally, uh, you know, home in on an, on an account. But um, there are two possibilities. One possibility, which is uh, what uh, Vieri Samaklorovici has been def defending for decades, essentially, which is a very, very compelling theory, which is that basically there is no left peripheral focus in Italian. Really what happens is the focus is in a somewhat lower position, potentially even not even moved in anywhere. And actually what follows that seemingly left peripheral focus is right dislocated. Okay, and he has really strong arguments for that. Now, if that's the case, okay, then after this focal element here, uh, Germanico, you will actually get an intonational phrase boundary and everything else will be right dislocated. Now, if that's the case, you know, that's not going to be very hard for us to, uh, to, to account for because b basically the syntactic structure is, is such that these elements would have in, be in a peripheral position. I'll, I'll uh, talk, talk, walk you through that part in a, in a minute, okay? But if he's wrong, okay, and some people have proposed that he's wrong, in particular Bocci and Avesani have proposed that actually if you look at a, 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 a phonetic um, track, then you can't really see hard evidence for um, an intonational phrase boundary following the left peripheral focus. Okay, so kind of the worst scenario for us is if they are right, uh, but as I said, the jury is still out at the moment. But if there is no phonological phrase bound, if there's no intonational phrase boundary here, and it's not the case that these things are really right dislocated, then how do we account for these? Now, um, what is important to notice uh, is that uh, in these cases, um, you don't get verb movement, uh, uh, even though in this particular example you don't see that because there happens to be the verb adjacency between the focal and the verbal element, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, but what is uh, very important to notice is that uh, 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 these constructions are actually, uh, they have a lot of restrictions, okay? So they are not your 
cl classic focus construction like you get in Hungarian, which is, for instance, you know, a simple answer to a WH question. Okay? So in Hungarian, you ask a WH question, you answer with the focus construction. But not in Italian. In Italian, uh, there is a very strict uh, pragmatic restriction on this construction, with the left peripheral focus construction. Uh, some people say you can only use it in corrective context. Other people say you can use it also in mirative context. At least it has to be strongly contrastive. It cannot simply be a new information focus. Now, people have tried to account for this in, in, in different ways. So one of the proposals is, for instance, is that this kind of contrastive focus construction uh, would be in a different syntactic position. Okay, that's their, their account. Well, um, that really doesn't uh, cut it because that, you know, then, then the idea that one of them would contain a verb movement and the other not would be completely uh, ad hoc. Uh, other people have proposed that it's also tied to only root contexts, which uh, um, could be, you know, another restriction on this. And and then uh, yet others have noticed that these things are very edge aligned. Okay, so the fo focus in 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 Italian uh, has to be at the at the left edge, uh, or, um, uh, but it does not necessarily. Uh, but yeah, but it's a kind of marked construction. Okay, so uh, what we uh, um, what we capitalize on is this idea of contrastivity. Okay, and what we're saying is that actually, even though this thing happens to be at the left edge of the f of the intonational phrase, it's not th the motivation for it to move is not actually prosodic. Okay, the motivation is to uh, to uh, to satisfy a, a, a sort of mapping between information structure and syntax. Okay, so it's not about the PF. Uh, interface. It's about some other interface. Okay, uh, the uh, the one between information structure and um, and um, and syntax, and it happens to be uh, in, in, in this position because of some independent reasons, okay, not because of prosody, okay, and in, and in actual fact, the prosodic mapping has to be violated, okay, it has to be a sort of strange mapping, it has to be a mapping that you don't normally get, which again uh, goes hand in hand with the idea that it's a pragmatically really marked construction. Okay, now this is uh, what I think about Italian, uh, if it turns out that those things are not right dislocated. But, uh, but what actually happens in uh, languages with right with oriented stress? I, I want to talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so Hungarian, we said, had a leftward oriented stress. What you get is a situation where verb movement can create a position for focus for that reason. Okay, what happens in right peripheral languages is quite different, and I think that's really interesting that you get an asymmetry there. Now, in, in a language where the focal element wants to appear in a right peripheral position, like at, so at the right edge of the intonational phrase, because this is the position that main stress gets assigned in a rightward oriented uh, stress language, you get various options. One of your options is if this happens to be an object, then you just leave it in situ, okay? You just leave it where it is. It is at the right position for taking up stress, so why, 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 why bother? But in many languages, there are at least elements that you can't put in the, in the, in the inside the verb phrase, like let's say a subject, for instance. And then it, uh, it looks like those things can be adjoined to the, to the, to the VP. Think of post-verbal subjects in Italian. Think of many African languages that have different strategies for subject focusing and for object focusing, where the objects and, and low adverbs just seem to be in situ. Now, these are excellent positions for focus so long as the verb is at least as high as this, okay? Um, as, especially this one uh, uh, is really only uh, supported by, uh, by, the, by the fact that the, the verb is at least as high as, a little bit higher than that position. Why is that? Well, it's because the intonational phrase gets mapped from whatever the, f the phrase that the verb uh, hosts, okay? That's by, defin by our definition. Okay, now this actually uh, allows for uh, an account of heavy MP shift in English, okay? Now, in English, we have to assume an, uh, that, that actually the, the I node is, is, is active, or at least the small V node, but probably the I node is active in English. Uh, or even though you don't always get V to I movement in English, you do, you do get do support, and you have a lot of evidence for the language learner that what you want to map uh, for your international phrase is, is, the, is the IP. Okay, now if that's the case, then then the verb is high enough. Okay, and then that actually creates a position to the right edge of the verb phrase in an adjoined position, but under the I node, that can host uh, focal elements. Okay, because uh, you you get the IP uh, 
to be the intonational phrase, and then the rightmost element of that will be precisely that, the joint phrase. Okay, so that's uh, um, our analysis of, uh, of, he of heavy MP shift. Okay, now I also talked about uh, topics in a left peripheral position, and what do topics do in a left peripheral case? Well, as I said, topics move higher than the verb does, so th they fall outside the innermost intonational phrase uh, on the left. And what happens on the right is, uh, is exactly the same if you have uh, elements that are adjoined not to the VP this time, so not the position where the heavy MP shift would be, but the position that's higher in the tree on the, on, on the right, uh, uh, then those things will automatically fall outside the intonational phrase, the core intonational phrase. And that's uh, uh, exactly what people have proposed for right dislocation in Romance languages, in particular in Italian. So what you get in, a, in, in such a language is a structure like this. Uh, he introduced Mary to John, and to John can actually be in a, in, a right, in a really high right dislocated position. And in that case, what you will uh, predict, uh, given that the stress is rightward oriented, is the phrasing that you see here. Okay? The intonational phrase, the core intonational phrase, will, uh, will be whatever is in front of the right dislocated element, and whatever is right dislocated will follow that. Okay? And just like the topic on the left in Hungarian, this part will be skipped by the stress rule, because the stress rule really operates on the innermost intonational phrase. Okay, so again, from the fact that this time the verb is lower than the, the right dislocated element, we get for free the fact that those elements are outside the core intonational phrase. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what, I, uh, what I would like to uh, just uh, summarize is that in a case of Italian right dislocation, you get de accenting, uh, you know, lots of prosodic markers of the fact that this uh, thing is outside the, international fr the core intonational phrase. And indeed, those elements are adjoined high. In the English heavy MP shift, the, ex the adjoined element seems to be adjoined lower, and it picks up the main accent. Uh, you know, in, in fact, it's really a, a focus you know, device in, in English, or it could be viewed as such. Now, this, uh, this, uh, this dichotomy actually falls out of this analysis because the position of the verb, or the position of the finite element, is what determines the intonational phrase. And in, 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 both case, in one of the cases, that the, the, the adjoined element will fall inside that, and in the other case, it will fall outside of that. Okay, so um, let me see if I have a bit more time. Okay, uh, I think I have t uh, time to, uh, to talk about two, two more things. Um, the second one I will cut quite short. But um, first, um, I just want to sort of give you a, a little idea of, of how, how this typology would, would unfold. Okay, so so far I spoke about Hungarian, uh, which has left peripheral focus. And in Hungarian, what you get is, you saw, is verb movement to the left, and then it creates a specifier position. Now, I also spoke about the fact that you, you can have a position for focus on the right, which has to be that now lower than the verb. So there's, a, there's like an asymmetry in these positions. Now, where else can we possibly have focus positions, if you see what I mean? What are the logical possibilities? How can we create syntactic um, configurations that would be good for focusing, depending on whether the stress is leftward oriented and rightward oriented? And I, I, I sort of, you know, this is this is where we are now. We're sort of, we've we've carved up the space, and now we're going to have to to look at different languages. And 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 I, I don't have a lot to say about whether these things exist or or, or how would they look like, but a, a little bit maybe. So one possibility you could have a situation where the verb moves, but the verb actually moves to the right rather than to the left, but the specifier still gets created very high on the left. That would be like a somewhat symmetric option of Hungarian. Um, and there could also be a language which has verb movement to the right and the specifier gets projected to the right. And now that's extremely rare. You know, functional specifiers tend to be projected on the left. Uh, and also, if a language is so strictly head final that even in a moved position, the verb would, uh, the, the finite element would move uh, on the right, then I think it's quite possible that 
whatever other config, whatever other characteristics such a language would have would actually allow it to have a focused position in a much cheaper way. Okay, so for that reason, I think these languages are probably not so not so common. Okay, because if you are the type of language that has this type of verb movement, then you're probably going to have an, a, a, an easier option of focusing, and that's this. Okay, so in strictly head final languages like Turkish, okay, uh, is uh, one of the examples where I think this may be on the right track. We sort of started to look at the data a little bit. In Turkish, which is uh, uh, strictly head final, what you have as an option, okay, is because it's got a rich case system, okay, you can actually put the focal, focal element next to the verb, okay, even though it's not it's not its object okay so it, it, you know there's no there's much more freedom in what uh, the order of the elements are and in particular there is this little intonational phrase here which is just composed of the verb which is final and of the immediately preceding element but it's all syntactically quite low okay um, and if that's the case for 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 Turkish, you know, if, if you can if you can do that, if you can exploit this position for focus, okay, then it seems to me to be less likely that you would do all these movements to to create a focus position. But as I said, all I can tell you at this at this point is that this is a logical possibility. It's just my intuition about how head final languages work suggests to me that it's not going to be probably. That, that were like tested and um, you know we would have to wait and see if we can really analyze Turkish in this way. Okay now there is the opposite of that uh, what are the possibilities uh, uh, well as I said in, um, in, in a lot of Bantu languages you get uh, the focal element uh, following either directly following the verb in some Bantu languages or in others uh, you know inside the VP at the, at the sort of the right edge of the VP. And again, that, that sort of follows if the, if the domain that the verb uh, determines, okay, is exactly the domain that, that contains, contains that element. Uh, and in, in, in certain cases, it might be that there's like an additional um, uh, requirement that not only does the verb has to be, not, not only does the, the, the XP have to be rightmost, in, in, in the verb phrase, but, but it also has to be adjacent to the verb. And then what happens in those languages is that you actually sort of take things out of the VP and put them in, in peripheral positions uh, in order to, to arri arrive at this kind of really strict configuration. That, that's in this system, that's how you would need to think about those cases. I don't know if it would work. Well, we are going to have to look at it. Okay, so the final uh, um, thing I want to discuss, if I have maybe like eight more minutes, do I have eight more minutes? Yeah, okay. It's complex clauses, and this is just to show you that the system sort of carries over to, to complex uh, clauses in a, in a natural way. So um, you, don't, you don't need to make any further assumptions, and um, you know, that our prosodic uh, um, analysis is exactly the same. So we looked at the exact same uh, question contour in Hungarian and the exact same um, tonal processes in, in Bassa to support the prosodic analysis. Okay, so uh, if you have a complement clause or a temporal causal adjunct clause, which is not moved, which is, which is just an in situ position, then you would actually not expect it to form its own intonational phrase based on the mapping. And that's because, uh, remember, what really matters for determining your core intonational phrase is the root verb, okay? So the embedded verb does not in itself create an intonational phrase by the mapping, okay? Only the root verb creates an intonational phrase, only that one must be mapped onto an intonational phrase. So what you would expect is, is, is actually not to have a separate intonational phrase, and in fact, you get this really long um, sentence with, 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 with a single question tune, okay? So you, it gets anchored on the main verb, and it goes all the way until the end. You don't get twice or something like that. Okay, so that's sort of, you know, and, and the, the Bassat tonal cases are, are supportive of that. Just to compare this, you know, I, I give you the, uh, an example where you actually have a, a direct rotation. So the earlier sentence said something like, uh, did Leila ask Eleonora whether the Malay girl escaped to Emilia? Okay, and in this one, it says, Leila asked uh, 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 Eleonora, the Malay girl escaped to Emilia? Okay, so there's a direct rotation of a question. And now you can see that you get a declarative tune on the first part and the question tune only starts on the embedded verb, as you would expect. 
um, if it's a direct quotation. So if you want to compare these two, it's kind of nice. Okay, uh, now this is the same example for with an adjunct clause. So this one is Peter um, takes the children to the museum while Mary is working. Okay, the while Mary is working is here. This is the, the verb, but it does not start the new tune. It's the, the tune starts here, okay, the main, on the main verb. Okay, now if you now have an extraposed adjunct or complement clause, or subject clauses in Bassa, I think have to be, um, if I remember correctly, but I'm not sure about that now, uh, as I said it. So, but if you have an ad, uh, a clause that is, is, is adjoined to either a high left peripheral or a high right peripheral position, you would expect from this system that they would fall outside of the core intonational phrase. And that's exactly what you, what you get. So if you have the adjunct clause while Mary's working, it has a really flat intonation, and then you get a topic, which is still flat, and then you get the start of the question tune on the main verb, okay? Just like you would expect. Okay. Now, uh, importantly, um, it's not the case uh, that an embedded clause would never ever come with its own intonational phrase, okay? And in fact, our system actually allows for that, it, that if you have an independent reason why you would want to have an intonational phrase for the embedded clause, for the embedded clause, then you can do that so long as it's really properly aligned with the, with the embedded verb, okay, the highest posi position of the finite verb inside the embedded clause. And that's because, you remember, the syntax prosody mapping tells you you must have one for the whole sentence, but the prosody syntax mapping tells you you can have one for any clause so long as it's aligned with the clause and not just like in the middle of it or something like that, okay? So, for instance, you might sometimes have a situation where you want to focalize something, okay? And uh, you have a, a whole, like a, a main clause, but something from the complement clause that's focalized. Now, one of the options you have is simply mo t take that element from the embedded clause and move it all the way up to the higher clause into the focus position, okay? But some speakers don't allow it. But this is a speaker who does allow it. So in this case, you get something like, uh, Leila, the Malai girl accusative said that she will escape from Emilia, okay? You don't actually have the she, so it's really from the embedded clause, okay? So it's like what we call long focus movement. Focus uh, originates in the embedded clause, moves to the focus position of the higher clause. It actually triggers verb movement in the higher clause if you, you don't see it because there's no particle, but it does. Um, and then as we predict, this gets main accent, the question tune gets uh, anchored on that focal element and it goes all the way. So this is a case where you have one large intonational phrase and the focus moves all the way up. But what if you don't want to do it or if you're uh, one of those speakers that this prefers this kind of long movement, then you will kind of have to put it in the embedded focus position, okay? So what you get in, in, in this case actually is a very strange thing in Hungarian that um, you will have to introduce a little um, pronominal type element, okay, which really um, sort of uh, is uh, corresponding to the embedded clause, okay, and that little pronominal type element will occur, will have to move into the focus position of the, of the main clause, okay, and then your real focus will move into the focus position of the embedded clause. So it's a little bit like uh, partial WH questions, where you get uh, some kind of like a, a, a marker in the higher, higher position. But you know, whatever the syntactic and semantic analysis of this is, we can sort of not worry about it at this point. What we predict is that the prosody will be such that you will get uh, the, uh, the anchor only on the, on the embedded clause this time, because that's the main, main stress. Uh, and that's actually true because, um, yeah, let, let's not worry about that. You can ask me about it if you want. Okay, uh, now there is also an alternative intonation, which is a really interesting one. Uh, uh, depending on what the meaning is, uh, you can actually have two tunes, okay? So you can sort of pretend that those intonational phrases are really real and you can have a, a sort of a double question tune uh, in, in certain cases. Um, that, that's also a possibility. Okay. So, uh, as I said, a welcome corollary of our proposal is that although it's possible to have extra I boundaries to satisfy, for instance, informational structural needs, the position of those boundaries is actually regulated by the mapping principles and they have to be exactly where syntactic clauses lie. 
Okay, so to conclude, our flexible proposal for the syntax prosody mapping allows for an account of the Hungarian left peripheral focus construction, the topics in Hungarian and Basa, and uh, English heavy MP shift and Italian right peripheral focus and right dislocation. And it does so without making direct reference to information structural notions like fo topic or focus. Okay, So uh, if you're familiar with the prosody literature, a, a, a lot of people try to account for special focal intonations or special topical intonational patterns by, uh, by assigning principles like, you know, the focus introduces an intonational phrase boundary or the topic has to be followed by this or that or the other. But in so far in all the cases that we looked at, it sort of falls out of the system that, that, that these guys move to positions where naturally they would occur, they would get the pr prosodic properties that they would need. So uh, our proposal makes uh, testable and possibly quite wrong predictions about the typology expected focal configurations and we'll look at those. Um, and uh, thereby we would like to sort of, you know, contribute to this idea of specifying that syntax prosody mapping because I, I, I would like to remind you that in a, in a, in a, in a theory that is not syntactocentric, there is a huge burden on, on, on us to specify exactly how that mapping works uh, in order for language to be usable. You know, prosody and syntax has to be sort of mapped onto each other sort of deterministically, as you see here. Okay, um, and... Um, as I said, the proposed uh, mapping principles refer to the overt position uh, of the highest uh, finite word. Uh, and, you know, there is a sort of syntactic question there if you're interested in, in these kind of things, you know, that people propose all kinds of uh, functional hierarchies, or some people, some people do. And, you know, if really what matters is where the verb actually sits in terms of the prosody, then maybe we can sort of t t try to go back to works that have been proposed in sort of early 2000 and, and, and things like that, which really wanted to say, well, actually those positions get created by the verb movement itself. So it might sort of allow you to, to think of the extended projection, the syntactic extended projection in the grammar and sort of with new eyes. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. For your attention.